Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. The committee has received apologies from Bill Bowman, MSP, this morning, so I welcome Finlay Carson, MSP, who is attending in his place. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off your mobile phones or switch them to silent? Thank you. Item one is declaration of interests. I invite Finlay Carson to declare any relevant interests. Thank you, Convener. I, I declare no relevant uh, interest in refer reference to the, the general remit of the committee. However, uh, with regards to the, the items we're going to discuss this morning, I declare that I'm a member of the National Farmers Union of Scotland and also a partner in a small holding. Thank you very much indeed. Item two is decision on taking business in private. Does the committee ag agree to take item five in private this morning? Yeah, agree. Thank you. Item, sorry, item three is another decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take consideration of a draft report on the 2016, 17 and 17, 18 audits of NHS Tayside in private at future meetings? Thank you. Item four is post-legislative scrutiny, control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010. I'd like to welcome Christine Graham, MSP, to the committee's meeting this morning. Uh, Christine Graham, I'd like to invite you to make a brief opening statement, please. Oh, thank, thank you very much. And can I thank you, convener of the committee, inviting me to the se evidence session as you review the control of Dogs Scotland Act. 2010, I, I note the presence of Alec Neil, and you may be aware that, in fact, he did all the heavy lifting on the legislation, uh, and I really just dotted the I's and crossed the T's. Um, uh, the significance at that time, I think, was very important, and it's still a very important piece of legislation, because uh, following an incident many, many years ago when a little girl was savaged by Rottweilers, uh, legislation was put through the Dangerous Dogs Act, which, you know, like m many bits of legislation uh, done uh, at, a, at, a, uh, you know, at a pace, uh, was flawed because it focused on breeds. This took it where it should have been, which was to the owner. So it became the deed not the breed. And in fact, I think it's still a substantial piece of legislation. It's been relatively successful, not just in recorded dog control notices, but on perhaps unrecorded uh, data, which is perhaps when uh, a dog warden or environmental warden just simply speaks to somebody discreetly uh, as a light touch before they proceed. They may make a note of this. I'll come to that later. But these things also happen. So I think it has to a limited extent, I'll come to why it's limited, but it was important that it turned the legislation on its head and made the owner, the controller of the dog, responsible, not the dog itself, because the vast majority of dogs have not got behavioural problems if properly handled. Now, I've taken the opportunity to read some of the evidence you've obtained, and I want, if, if you wish, I would focus on the following, the training of dog wardens, the number of dog wardens, which agency has responsible for what, police or the council, public knowledge of the legislation, you raise the issue of a national database and dog licensing. So if I took these in order, in training, I agree with you that there is a disparity throughout Scotland. I mean, I have met the dog wardens in my constituency, in the of the borders, both of whom, uh, the main dog wardens, and one it's a dog warden, the other it's a dog warden stroke environmental warden, are very experienced behaviourists with dogs, very experienced, a huge regard for them. In fact, the dog warden in Midlothian also has a police logo on the side of his van. What he does, and Emeta tells me, is that if it's a light touch, he parks his van away from the house and he, uh, where the dog is and goes around and talks to the people. He doesn't make a big deal of it, he doesn't make a big scene, but he warns them that there will be consequences if they don't do certain things, you see. But a notice taken of that, and it's also given to the police. So if there's a repeat, then that you know the next step is taken uh, in the in the process uh, of what they must do. So I think it isn't uniform throughout Scotland. Now the agency who's responsible for what is a nightmare, um, because I mean many people don't even know that the act existed, and I'm interested that Finlay Carson said a member of the NFUS. Now, I met someone from the NFUS at one of the agricultural shows who was going about you know dogs, um, you know savaging sheep and upsetting them and so on. And I said, you do know about the Control of Dogs Act? And they had no idea. 
Uh, and I said, well, that could be used by a farmer in early days if somebody's setting off with their dog and the sheep are in lamb, and even if it's on the leash, it's too close to them. They didn't know about it. I don't think the man and woman in the street know about it. I see from your evidence that there's difficulty between the police and the council knowing who's responsible for what. And I've had cases where people have said, you know, I had that dangerous dog and I got the police. And I said, do you ever think of using the Control of Dogs Act? They didn't know about it. They didn't know. And I'm not talking about a dangerous dog. It's a different category entirely. But, you know, I'm frightened by the dog next door or when we pass at the gate and so on. So that's there. So public knowledge of the legislation is a huge issue. And this brings me to a bugbear of mine, uh, and that is a member's bill gets no publicity other than what the member will provide. So that... And now, that's fair enough at the beginning when you put forward a consultation, and it's fair enough, perhaps, at the point where it becomes an Act of Parliament. But after that, there is no publicity. The Scottish Government can, if it wishes, give publicity, but doesn't have to and hasn't done as far as I know. So you, unless you pay out of your own allowances, nobody gets to know about it. National database, yes, Absolutely. We have about 10 microchipping companies that the government uh, has said, you know, they are certified. Surely there's a portal. I'm not technical, but you could feed these into your national database. You don't have the problem of a dog in one area being out of control, served on notice, and they just move to somewhere else. I don't know why that's not happening. It help my bill that we're coming to anyway. And dog licences. I can perhaps answer questions in that. I see you want to move on, quite understand it. Dog licences, when I talk about responsible dog ownership bill, which sort of deals with that prospect. We will, uh, would like to take evidence, if we may, uh, Christine, first of all, on the 2010 Act, and then we're going to ask you a bit, a bit later on so we can try and keep this neat about your former proposal, but sorry, your current proposal, but I understand there might be a bit of overlap. So um, I'm going to ask Willie Coffey to open questioning for the committee. Thanks, Camilla. Good morning, Christine. Um, the, the initial policy memorandum told us that the, the bill was designed to identify out-of-control dogs at an early juncture and provide the means to change their behaviour before they become dangerous. What are your views on whether that has proven to be successful? Do you think there's been an issue with the legislation itself, or do you think there's been an issue with the implementation of that? And could you help us to understand what your thoughts are? I think the main issue has been with implementation. Uh, I think the, 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 it was pretty sound in the first place um, that you know people were responsible for what their dog does. And a, an issue that, that Rose also was, and I should have mentioned this, that it's a dog out of control even in a private place, which wasn't the case in England, because it's um, you know many of the attacks are, took place in, in somebody's home or in their garden. And that legislation moved responsibility into a place that is private. So even if you get a notice in the gate saying, beware of the dog, that doesn't exonerate you. In fact, that's very wrong. What's the other way? You shouldn't have, that, have to have that on your gate. Doesn't A child of 10 or 9 going in is not going to pay attention to beware of the dog necessarily, and certainly not a child that can't read it. So it doesn't. that's not helpful. So I think it was the implementation. Um, I think this is a huge issue for all members' bills. So I think what you've come across here is an issue that extends to other member bringing forward a bill in this parliament. What sort of measures do you think, though, we should be and could be looking at to assist us with better, stronger implementation, to prevent, not to to deal with a bite when it happens and, and after that? Because most of the evidence we received kind of tended to be in that area where bites and attacks had occurred. Then we deal with it. How do we do, how do we work better to try to influence the behaviours before the attacks occur, do you think? Well, first of all, I mean, it's probably crossing over other questions, is publicity, so that the neighbour or the person walking their child to school sees this and knows how to report it. Now, there were issues about identification, but most people carry a mobile phone these days, can take a picture of the dog, take a picture discreetly, perhaps, of the owner with the dog. That's And it's a civil matter, so it doesn't need corroboration. Uh, so in those circumstances, I think if more people knew about it, if the NFUS lady had known about it, I'm not saying it would have solved everything for farmers, but I think it would certainly have helped them. Uh, and, and I just think to get to the stage, if you, if, I don't know if you've questioned the public, I don't know if I saw this in the evidence, as to how many knew about this piece of legislation. I mean, the public at large, I think very few know. But they all know about you don't smoke in public places. They all know about minimum unit pricing. Why? Because it's been publicised. 
Okay, thank you for that. Hope to, hopefully I can come back to you later as well. And ask Sarbar. Christine, can you just talk us through with what the balance you think is in terms of gaps in the law and then gaps in the implementation of the law and, and resourcing of the law? I, I, I actually think... I'm going to be really rude about some government legislation, not just this government, but previous governments. I think that piece of legislation was pretty well drafted. Uh, I think it's practical matters that are the issue here, frankly. I mean, we've had legislation in my 20 years here, some of which is in dust on the shelves that nobody knows about and just as well. Uh, but this was a very practical piece, you know, that intervened early on. And I've always been one for animal welfare. That is, doesn't discount, of course, the horrors that happened to children, frightening them. The worst thing that can happen... Um, not the worst, but one of the really bad things that happens to a young child is to be frightened by a dog and then it lasts throughout their life. I don't even want that to happen, let alone savaging sheep. So, you know, my huge thing here is I think the, you could tweak it. I see you want to look at the penalties and so on. That's, that's fair enough. But I think in substance, the principle and purpose of the deed, not the breed, was absolutely excellent. And I commend uh, Alec Neil for taking that route because it really was a shift in perception with which the majority of the public agree. And we've all been in situations where, I think we've all been in situations where you've said, you know, I'm worried, that, that dog's, nobody's, it's just running loose, it's, you know, it's going to cause trouble. or it's, And the thing is, it's about not just causing trouble and anxiety and distress to other people, it's to other animals. So that's why it was good legislation, if it was aggressive towards your dog or to another animal or to a person. So I actually thought, in substance, it was OK. And I'll focus in a, in a moment on on the law being being okay and how it's better resourced, but but just going back to the law itself, what do you think the gaps are in the law if we did decide to, as a parliament, to strengthen the legislation? I I, I mean I I'm going to defend it because I think actually um, the issues you're fine. I'm not saying that the the. the the, um, you need to defend it. I agree. It's, it's a good piece of legislation. I mean, how do you make it even better is probably the, a, a better way of putting it. Start with the implementation. I don't think... I mean, to me, um, I, you know, if the implementation, if we had training, if we had professional training ensuring that people who... Um, I mean, I've even heard the dog warden was frightened of dogs. I mean, that's just ridiculous. So if you had training of dog wardens who, who knew what they were doing, exempting the two that I know, if you had training... If you had some funding behind it, if you had publicity, think where that might take you before you need to change the actual legislation itself. And then just on, on the actual delivery, you said in your opening um, around the lack of training, um, around the individual had no idea of the law. You, know, you said that the, the man and woman on the street don't know about the law, um, the relationship between the police and local authorities. I think that's that's everything that we have heard in, in all the evidence sessions that we've had. So in terms of the balance of that, is it uh, there's not enough size of a workforce? There's the one, then not only there's not a size of a workforce, is it that the workforce that we do have isn't adequately trained? What's the gaps there? Is it a lack of resources? Is the money not there to, to do it? Um, what are the practical resourcing, as well as the publicity, which I completely agree about, what is the practical resourcing that needs to happen? I think, first, let's start with the police. You know, um, some police don't know about the Control of Dogs Act, not their fault. Again, we're back to publicity and information. I read about the protocol and how it's patchy. Um, and back to this theme of mine, that once, after all, a member's bill is given authority by Parliament. You can't get it through without Parliament. And, and to me, maybe not the same status as government legislation, but it should certainly have government assistance once the Parliament has agreed it. Because at that stage... Many members' bills, not just mine, will fail or will flounder anyway because they simply don't have that fair wind behind it to make it successful. Whether that is more resources to local government, and heavens, we know how difficult it is there. But let's start with training. Let's start with um, people um, being, uh, uh, being uniform throughout Scotland. Let's start with information, following it through. Uh, on images and television, publicity. But let's start with these things and see where that takes you. I mean, you could even have, um, as we all do going to schools, you can, you know, you, children can be told about the things that you do know that if you're frightened of this, you can, there is a piece of legislation so that for the sake of the dog, as much as for the sake of the child and the owner, uh, you can, this can be reported to the council if it's at that level. 
I think that's where I would start, and I would suggest that for many members' bills, not just mine. And final question, would that be your message directly to the Minister who will be taking evidence from straight after you? Yes, and I've said it to them before. Uh, I, I mean, I, I had a question to the corporate body about the, which I have here, which you can locate, which was about why there isn't funding for members' bills once they become law. And I was told that's a matter for the government and the government to take up whoever that government is. And I think we need to, we need to move on that as a parliament. Thank you. Christine Graham, I, I hear, I hear um, loudly what you're saying, that um, there's not enough knowledge of, of the law. And it, it leads me to wonder, I mean, I've said this and we've taken evidence on this before, I believe that good law is clear law, so that people understand specifically what the law is. Now, if we were to summarise the 2010 Act, it would seem to me that a very crude summary of it is it is, an, it is an owner's responsibility of how your dog behaves. Do you think that is strong enough to be clear law? Or do you think actually the penalties for the owner make, you know, the dog not behaving are strong enough? Because, you know, we can say the act is, is fine and, uh, you know, it would work well if it was implemented properly. But the reality is we've seen a huge increase. I think it was 5,000 uh, ad admissions to A&E last year with, with, with yeah. dog bites. Um, some of the evidence we have heard from children being attacked from dog on dog attacks is really uh, quite harrowing. So... <laughs> I suppose the committee is in the position where perhaps the 2010 legislation was a good piece of law, but the reality is that it's not being understood, uh, and I don't, I'm not sure if that can just come down to publicity. Well, first of all, these attacks are horrendous, and, and I despair of these, and I despair of people, and I see that dog's been put down as if that solves the problem. It's not The problem is not solved. Um, I prefer the carrot to the stick. I mean, there will be people... And we know there are people who obtain an, uh, dogs to use uh, to threaten as weapons and so on. It's a status symbol. And like them to be aggressive. And again, they train them sometimes to be aggressive. But they're in the minority. Most of the people who have problems with the control of their dogs do through having the wrong dog, the wrong place, the wrong time, not training it, not exercising it, and so on. So... It, I, of course, there have to be penalties of some kind at the end of it, but to me, that's the last resort because the Control of Dogs Act started with things like you get the dog control notice, you may have to muzzle the dog, you may have to take it to training. These were all positives for the owner. You want to work with the owner at that low level. I'm not talking about a vicious attack. You want to work with the owner, and that's why I commend uh, the Midlothian um, dog warden, Tam, who even at an even lower level, goes and speaks to people. And then, if it does pr proceeds, then actually goes on and says, we'll have to have a dog control notice issued. Here are the things you must do in the interests of you, in the interests of the public, in the interests of the dog. So I quite like the idea that it is a change, an educational tool for people when, they're, when they've got a dog. Penalties, yes, and it, it's, I, I have no particular feelings one way or the other if you want to increase the penalties, but that's a last resort. What you want to do is change the way people have their dogs, train their dogs, control their dogs. That's what we want to do in the first instance, way before we ever get a dog biting somebody or attacking them. Well, we maybe need to ask what you do to improve the Act, but I think that's <coughs> perhaps your next proposal. But I'm going to take a couple of other questions first before we come on to that. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, some of the things you mentioned in your opening statement, Christine Graham, the, first of all, the database. Now, Section 8 of uh, the Act empowers ministers to establish a database, but that's never been done. Do you recall any discussions with the, the then Scottish Government around the establishment of a dog control database? And do you have any idea of why it's not been established since the Act came in? Eight years ago, and uh, I, I'm sure I would because I'm noisy, uh, so I'm sure I did go on about a national database, and I'm certainly going on about it now with my proposed bill coming forward because it makes sense. I mean, law, you're a lawyer, Mr Kerr, like I used to be as well. There's no point in having laws if they're not practical. And the practical effect of the national database is that you can't have people moving about. And now that we have all dogs eight weeks microchipped, 
they're not on a national database. As I said, there's 10 different companies. That's fair enough, but they should all be able to be you know, put together and compounded onto a national database so you can track them. So the same should be true of any dog control notice issued. So if one is issued, let's say, in the borders and somebody moves to Lanarkshire, yes, you can follow it through. So, you know, to me, it's just common sense. And um, I'm only one person. I can't make things. This committee, perhaps, well, I know what does it mean, perhaps. This committee can push the government far further than I can. But I think your argument for a national database is absolutely rock solid. Thank you. And uh, sticking with that sort of area, you talked about how the dog control notice is uh, local. Uh, so you, you can move, rehome the dog to another local authority and, and drop off the radar, uh, to coin a phrase. So can I take it then you, you would be supportive of amending the Act such that the dog control notice applies throughout Scotland? Uh, and, and not just in a specific local authority area. Yes. I would also, I don't know if it's within the remit of what you're doing, but also that the microchipping database is also on, and you, you, have a, you have one database for dogs. I'm just laying the ground for my bill, but you know, the microchipping would be on that national database, which would then, using that, you would then have the dog control notices and the various other things that have been done. Sometimes just even the written warnings. Because, as I said in Midlothian, um, I know that Tam has gone out and just spoken to somebody, but it's recorded, but it's not a dog control notice. And it's not a formal written thing, it's just a bit that is recorded. I would like those also put on, so that if you've had a warning in one place, you know, just a word or two from the dog warden, and the police have been informed, you move somewhere else, that follows you. Thank you. And uh, final thing from me at the moment... Well, indeed, the dog somewhere else I should say it follows follows because you could change owners yes quite so it'd have to be it'd have to be tracked with a change of owner not just the the owner of the dog but the dog itself would be in the database the microchip and as you move you're supposed to as the dog moves to another owner you're supposed to get the data on the microchip changed as well of course mm -hmm. so the final thing for me at this stage uh, you also mentioned uh, at various times uh, a licensing scheme uh, so could you just elaborate on your, your view? Should we have a, a licensing scheme? And, and if so, how would enforcement work? How would the registration work and how would enforcement well, reach? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's loosely a licensing scheme. I mean, I was around when they had the £5 licence for dogs. There you are, I dated myself again. Uh, and people just got them. I mean, you couldn't possibly have a system where everybody obtaining a, a dog had to go through some kind of before a group of people to get a licence as you would for a taxi or whatever, you know, I mean, be a huge amount of funding, a huge amount of effort. What my proposed bill does, uh, uh, and I move on to this, which is responsible um, dog ownership, breeding and dog ownership. I'll not go into the breeding bit, but into the dog ownership bit. I intend, if I get this through, to put an onus on anyone acquiring, I use the term acquiring so they can't get around the idea of money changing hands, acquiring a puppy or dog to go through a checklist in law. Things like, um, are you aware of this breed? What are your domestic circumstances? What are your uh, work practices? You know, are you going to be around to look after the dog? Do you know how much it will cost? General things like this that any sensible person would go through before acquiring a puppy or a dog. And having, if this is in primary legislation, there would be, therefore, an assumption in law that you'd done those things. These things must be done between the person exchanging the animal. Uh, so the breeder will ask that, and they will ask the breeder, you must also see the dog with its mother, the puppy, I should say, with its mother. You know, go through all this. Um, all of that puts the duty on the acquirer of the dog to make sure that they're doing the right thing by themselves and the animal as far as is practicable. In that way, we, 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 do two, we do several things. We incidentally try to knock on the head some of the puppy factory farming because they wouldn't fit into that. You'd hit on the head some of the purchasing online. You would also hit on the head people who, and I understand this, see a puppy or something and there's the spontaneous thing, you know, knee jerk, oh, I love that, it looks like a little teddy bear, I'll get it doesn't suit their lifestyle, the animal is not properly looked after, where am I taking this? I'm taking this to the behaviour of the dog. Because a dog that is not properly looked after, that is not properly exercised, that is not properly trained, becomes a problem 
to the owner and to the rest of society. So I'm going right back even beyond the animal that is causing anxiety and distress to people to how did we get there in the first place? And one of the ways is the wrong dog in the wrong hands with the wrong person at the wrong time and in the wrong place. So if we can put these tests in, you then have a presumption in law that you've done that. So you've been given a license, as it were, if I use that very loosely, because you know the law. And if you've breached it by not by the welfare of the animal not being, you know, you've got it in the wrong place and it's misbehaving because it's not out for exercise, it's doing all that, you've breached the law. So everybody who acquires an animal after a certain date, it acquires a puppy or a dog after a certain date, will have been, just as they have with microchipping, will have been presumed that you, you've done all this. And that takes me to, well, where does that take us? It takes us to animal welfare issues, so that if there are an animal is causing uh, behavioural problems and so on under control of dogs, well, you should have known all that. No point telling, you know, say the dog warden can say, no point telling me you didn't realise this big dog needed exercise three times a day because it's a gun dog. You should have known that. It's in the law. So it's another push at people. It's education plus stick, but mainly education. I'm grateful, thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mira. Um, I'd like to have a look at the uh, dog control notices. There's, we've taken quite a bit of evidence on that. And the indications are that, uh, with one or two notable exceptions, very few dog control notices are issued. And when they aren't issued, uh, data protection seems to indicate that nobody can know what the terms of that dog control notice are. What, what, what's your thoughts about that? I actually can't comment on that because I've not, I've not really reflected on people knowing what the terms of the notice are. Are you telling me that someone who has reported this doesn't get told that there has been a dog control notice? They can find out, they there's can been find one. out there's a dog control notice. But not the terms of Not it. the terms. Well, um, I find that quite extraordinary because um, if you're being told one's been issued and you obviously know who you've reported, it seems to me to be um, strange that you can't be told that they've been told to put it in a muzzle because then you don't know if they're breaching it. So uh, have you challenged this? Well, we have been taking evidence on it in this committee and obviously the committee will decide what to do. brought in when it's just um, not, not relevant in my view in this mm. circumstance. How can you know? It's like somebody being out on bail uh, from in prison and one of the conditions is that they don't go down a certain street. Now, the, the people who are going to be prime witnesses in that trial have to know that they're not to go down that street so they can report them for breaching the bail conditions. So it would, seems to me it's rather like bail. Would you say that interpretation seriously impairs the usefulness of dog control notices? I don't use the word seriously, but certainly an impairment. Hmm. Do, do you think, just moving on from that and the fact that, you know, I would repeat again, there seems to be rather few dog control notices issued by most councils. Um, would it be better if we had a system of fixed penalty charges? Well, I told, I think I've already said, um, to repeat myself, that I think fines and penalties are the last stop. I mean, people could just pay them and nothing would change. So I think that the whole point is to change the behaviour of the owner for the sake of the dog, the owner and the public. You know, it's to change their behaviour. So the whole point of the dog control notice is about, you must, particularly ones I like, you must take your dog to training. And many people do now, and that's good. Take your dog to training, because dogs can be trained out of bad habits. I think that's very important. So I think, you know, the easy thing to do is to say, not have that, and just say, I'll fine you. Well, what happens then to the, to the changing the behaviour of that animal and the owner's behaviour? Nothing, necessarily. But given the fact that uh, the... The ultimate alternative is to, for the council usually to take the case to court and get a judgment there against the owner. Wouldn't it ease the administrative burden of that? Wouldn't it make it easier and quicker for a penalty to be to be imposed if there was a fixed penalty system? Because councils are not going to take the chance of spending all that money. Going so you're to court. not suggesting we ditch the other the other sort of um, ways of dealing with it. You're not suggesting that we we don't issue a dog control notice. Just not just go straight to a, a fixed penalty fine. You would just go to that perhaps after going to all the others. And it's for breach. It would be it would be a, a judgment as to whether minor breaches could be addressed more efficiently. Oh yes, not a problem. That. Not a problem. Minor breach, not a problem. I mean, I, the, the court process is 
is in some cases very heavy-handed and time-consuming. So a minor breach, yes, uh, not a problem, as long as we have the other penalties, such as um, you know changing the behaviour of the animal in place, uh, perhaps first. Not a problem. What, what would be your interpretation of a minor breach be, and what would still require to be reported to the Procurator Fiscal? I'd, in fact, let me backtrack. I don't want to talk about minor breaches. Let's say you take your dog, you've got to have your dog in a muzzle, and it's in the garden. You don't put the muzzle on until it gets outside the gate, but it's not met anything, and you've just forgotten. Um, I don't think that should be a fine. I think it's the facts and circumstances of the case. Um, and that's the usual lawyer's answer, the facts and circumstances. I think that it, you, you could have penalties. Say you had a frequent frequent minor breach, what you might call a minor breach, You're not putting the muzzle on, let's say, before it got to the gate, and they kept, they kept doing it. You might then say that that's a minor breach, but then it might move upward. So you'd have to look at the circumstances. You'd have to look at who you were dealing with. You know, if it was somebody who was a frail or, um, uh, you know, somebody incapacitated in some way and, and didn't do something that was on the dog control notice, you would look at them and say, well... I'm going to speech about this. I'm not fine. You have to. People, people are individuals. Applying a, a, a huge amount of flexibility there, and a huge amount of judgment, perhaps, to be exercised by the dog warden. And yet, you know, for the sake of law, there has to be a definition. But the law should. The law should always, apart from statutory breaches and traffic fences and so on. If you're going over 40 miles an hour on a 40 mile limit, yeah, that's it. There ain't any flexibility. But the law in circumstances is very flexible because any sheriff or justice, uh, in many circumstances, unless it's a mandatory. We'll look at the facts and circumstances of something that's happened. I mean, somebody might be, I'll give you an example, somebody might be very sick and racing out to get some, get somebody's racing out to get to hospital. And so the, the dog, they've not done something the dog they should have done. So they plead, yes, I've breached the dog control notice, but the issue was such and such, such and such. Are you going to treat them the same way as somebody goes, oh, I think I've tuppence the dog control notice, I'm doing this anyway? And different different reasons for people doing things. So yes, there's flexibility. You've got to be compassionate sometimes with people in certain circumstances. Just one final question. The law, obviously, at the moment, the Dog Control 2010, the, the Dangerous Dogs 2010 Act, is a, is a civil offence. Yes. Um, is there merit for more serious cases? And you know, this committee has taken evidence of some pretty horrendous instances. Uh, is there a case in, in certain circumstances that there should be a criminal element? Not under the Control of Dogs Act. I think that when, the whole point was low-level intervening early intervention. You then move into a dangerous dog. You then move into a completely different um, area. Now, sometimes, like all matters of um, fact and of law, there will be that transitional bit, that grey area where it moves, and that's for the judgment of, in those circumstances, I would say, the police, or even the council. If somebody come, comes in session, this dog's out of control, but in fact the behaviour's really of great concern and it has bitten somebody or something, then it should be referred to the police, and vice versa. That's where your protocol comes in. That's where the facts reported by the dog warden decide where it's going. I would not personally want the Control of Dogs Act to create a criminal offence because it's about changing owners' behaviour. And that's why you move into a different thing. If somebody gets a dog specifically to set it on people, you're not going to use the Control of Dogs Act. So would you define the, control, the, the, the Dangerous Dogs Act really as a lower level below any criminal Dangerous Dogs Act. The, the 2010 Act. Would you consider that, that is a lower level than criminality? So yes. the, cri there would still be, in your opinion, an element of criminality if a dog, for example, attacks a human or so on and does serious damage there. As you wouldn't use to the Control of Dogs Act. You wouldn't use it. Um, and that's why this protocol is so important. And that's why, okay. I mean, council, dog wardens are send many sensible people. As I say, the ones I know are great dog behaviourists. So they, they're pretty good at telling, say, well, look, this is not, this is not for the Control of Dogs Act. This is, this is, your dog's dangerous, period. I'm going to the police. So that's the kind of assessment that's made. And likewise, the police might say, look, 
your dog's not dangerous, but you're going to have to start making sure that it doesn't become that. So I'm referring this back to the council. You know, so that's where the judgments are made on the behaviour of, of it. Um, and, and that's the importance, but not to put them into the same category, because that's not what they're about. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Alex Neil, but before I do so, I'd like to add just a little bit of information since you're taking forward another bill, Christine Graham, on a point that Colin Beattie raised, and it's on the data protection point. We heard in the two evidence sessions that we did, one from victims of attacks and then from local authorities, that often when a dog control notice is issued, um, the person who has complained does not get any information, as Mr BT said, about the terms of that dog control notice and the reason they're frequently given by the local authority is data protection. And I think your evidence today is absolutely right, in, in my opinion, that then there can be no um, sort of self-enforcement or public enforcement if you don't know what the conditions are. For information, the committee wrote to the information or Information Commissioner's Office uh, in Edinburgh, who is in charge of data protection. I was quite disappointed with the letter. I don't know if members have had a chance to read it because the letter is, is very technocratic and it seems to fall down on the side of withholding the information, um, except in exceptional circumstances. It is an issue we're going to take up with the Minister but it is concerning as a result of the 2010 Act. I'm going to move on to Mr Neil. Excuse me, what was the reason given that it would be breach data? If you know who the person is, you already have identified the person. That's the personal data. You know who's had the dog control notice served on them. As you already know who they are, I can't see why that extends to not knowing what. What was the reason given? It's the quite... It is quite a technocratic letter. If I understand it correctly, it's about a power imbalance between the controller and data subject. We can share the Good letter grief. with you. What does that mean? Chris <laughs> and if you can make sense of it, then maybe we can confer at some point. Alex Neil. Yeah, and, and I think we would... Before we do that, Mr Neil, can I suggest you make the comparison with a bail order and a breach of bail uh, <laughs> to um, the data protection officer? I think we'll definitely pursue that, Christine. <laughs> The main thrust of my question is about your new legislation, but before we move on to that, can I ask you a very specific question, because you've two or three times this morning, rightly in my view, emphasised the importance of the protocol between the police and the local authorities about who does what and how the Dogs Control Act is supposed to be implemented. It's quite clear that, A, a lot of the people who are supposed to implement the protocol, like coppers don't know actually of its existence, let alone its contents. Uh, and clearly there is variability across the country about knowledge of and use of the protocol. Is there a case for putting that protocol into legislation? Uh, I don't know if I'd put a protocol into primary legislation, perhaps secondary legislation, because then you can move it around a bit. As you and I know, as everyone knows, you put it into primary, you've got to amend primary legislation. So probably the protocol should be in some guidance or whatever label you care to give it, so that you can tweak it if required tweaking later on. But there, but it, again, we're back to this, you know, who you can do this now, this committee can do this, which is what the member could not do. Um, and it would be wonderful if that would happen. It would be excellent because I think that this um, um, bill, and I'm not just um, carrying your favour here, Mr Neil, but I think it was it's, it's a good sound piece of legislation that, that, that deserves a second breath. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Can I just move on to your own legislation? Because obviously, as was pointed out earlier, we actually have your bill coming forward. We have a bill from Emma Harper coming forward, uh, specifically in relation to uh, worrying sheep. And we have government legislation coming forward that's already been announced in principle by uh, the, the, gov the Minister, Marie Goujon. So in terms of your bill, you've mentioned some of the provisions in it already. Could you give us an overview of the main bits of your bill? And could you ask us, uh, tell us how that would interact with Emma Harper's bill and the government's proposed legislation? Well, 
Yes. No, no, first, I don't know how we'll interact with Emma Harper spill because um, it's early days for her proposal, and mine has gone through, my proposal has sufficient support. There's two parts. There's the duties and responsibilities of breeders, reducing the number of litters that a breeder can have from five to three, and the government is picking that up, and that's okay, because obviously I've discussed along the road the, what I'm doing with the government minister, first with Rosanna Cunningham and then with Mary Goujon. Um, they're going to pick that up, but that doesn't destroy what I'm doing here in the bill. So even if that comes out, I've kept it in just in case they don't do it. Uh, but I'm also in this bill it, it, requiring a registration scheme for um, someone who says, you know, oh, my, 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 my uh, bitch has gone and had puppies, uh, you know, big mistake. Um, would you like one? Um, now, I'm, my position here is that when you're not a registered breeder and you just, you know, just have someone who's, or, or someone who genuinely just says, well, I wanted my bitch to have puppies and, you know, here, here are the cocker spaniels, I'm selling them. They're required to register temporarily with a local authority for up to six months for two reasons. We want to keep track of all puppies in Scotland who will be microchipped and keep track of them. It will stop irresponsible owners, maybe with their bitch, having puppies too frequently, just being irresponsible. It will also prevent illicit breeding. Somebody who says, I'm not a licensed, I'm not a, I'm not a breeder, but in fact they are. So if a name keeps occurring on this temporary register, and if we had a national register so they can't move about, then it, 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 you would be able to say, look, this person's name's come up a few times. It's rather like the adverts in Gumtree, when you, know, you see the Gumtree adverts. Uh, puppies, my bitches had puppies, and, you, and a name's put it, and in fact, it's a trader. So it's, 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 it's a hard game, it's a hard game to win, but it's several things doing there. So I'll have this temporary registration scheme. Um, so that's on the breeder side, but the breeder and the person who is a uh, uh, bitch has a litter has to also have the discussion that I mentioned earlier with the person acquiring the puppy or dog about, do you know about this breed? You know, do you know this? Do you know that? What's your home like? Do you have, are you up five flights of stairs? Why am the St Bernard in a tiny flat? You know, all these discussions. So it's a two-way street so that we've got the breeder or the licensed breeder, or the person who's a uh, bitch is just at a litter, has to have that, and will be deemed to have had that discussion with the person acquiring the dog. And the person acquiring the dog, likewise, has to check on the breeder. Are you registered? I know you've got to be registered because Christine Graham Bill says that. So are you on the national register as somebody who's got this litter of puppies? I didn't see you there. I didn't see in the register. Licensed breeders on the register. So we know that people are on now. That I, this is where data protection raises its head again, and we're working on that. This issue of being in it, but you know, the idea is that you can track that people where the puppies come from and that they're responsible breeders, whether professional or amateur, if I may call them that. And also, the person acquiring the puppy goes through all these checks. This is about. This is about the welfare of the animals and a good relationship. I mean, I had a dog many years ago. Great, great relationship. Wonderful. Don't have one now. Why? Because my job would not be suitable for me to have a dog. Love to have one. I want people to think very hard before they acquire a puppy or a dog and say, this is a commitment for 10, 20, 10, 15, 18 years. Can I take this on? Much so I want to. Can I take it on? And there's a responsibility in the lives and in, to affect, to impact on what you're doing and control of dogs and the behaviour of animals, I think we begin to solve some of the problems of animals. If I take, for example, the animals that come from these puppy factory farms, they're often not socialised. Um, the bitches are in terrible conditions, and we may have seen documentaries on the terrible conditions. The animals are not socialised. They have health problems. They have, they, have, they have mental health problems when they arrive. Their behaviour is erratic. They've not socialised with the mother and other puppies. So right from the start, you have a problem. For somebody who's probably a really nice person who maybe even thought they were rescuing the puppy uh, and are taking this on and it's too much for them to cope with. So this goes way back to the moment you acquire it before it becomes a problem out of control or a welfare issue.
So can I Because out of control is often a welfare issue. Aye, yeah, that, that's very helpful. Can I ask if any part of your bill makes any material change to the Control of Dogs Act uh, 2010? No. OK, and my final question is, given our experience with the lack of enforcement uh, of the Control of Dogs Act, what provisions are you making in your bill to make sure government, local government, police and any other authorities are mandated to implement the Act? And, and, no, sorry. And, and also, what sanctions will there be in your bill uh, for anyone who either breaches the provisions of it or doesn't implement it? For, for the breeders, there are the existing sanctions, licensing sanctions, if you breach licensing regulations, and these will apply to registration as well. For the people acquiring, we move into animal welfare legislation. I don't really need to create anything because we already have animal welfare legislation that deals with people um, when animals are not properly looked after. It's out of control. There's already the out of control, uh, dogs con uh, the control of Dogs Scotland Act. So I can, I can onward refer. What this is is evidential that when you acquire an animal, when you acquire a puppy or a dog, you are deemed to have known these things and you are deemed to have asked the breeder or the person transferring the dog or puppy these questions before you even got it, you know. So there's no point you saying afterwards, oh, you know, it's, it's too big for me to handle, it's running about, I can't even hold it on the leash, it's too strong. Excuse me, when you got that dog, you went through this and said, are you suitable, do you think you can be able to this big dog, do you have the suitable premises? That is not a defence to it anymore. So it assists the animal welfare organisations, it assists the police, it assists the councils because... This is what you should have known from the start. In other words, this to me is an educational tool. You know, minimum unit pricing, although it had penalties, was really an educational tool. Banning smoking in, in uh, public places, was an, although it had penalties, it was an educational tool. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not as important as the government, but this is another educational piece of legislation. Of course, there are consequences if you breach the law. They're either into offences under the Control of Dogs Act, offences for breaching licensing regulations, or offences against the welfare of the dog and the puppy. So there are offences. Finlay Carson. It all, it, it all seems like it might get a bit complicated. Is there not an argument that we should have one piece of legislation that covers all these things? Because as we've heard, we've, we've possibly got Emma Harper's bill which will look at sheep worrying. Um, we've got potential legislation coming forward for for different pets or breeding and puppy trafficking and whatever. Is there not an argument that we should really have one piece of legislation that looks at it all? Um, I suppose an anal analogy is a bit like the offensive behaviour at football. It's offensive behaviour wherever you are, whether it's football, rugby or whatever. So if we're looking at pieces of legislation that deal with dogs that have bad behaviour in a public place or bad behaviour near a field of sheep or a field of cattle and, and so on. Are we not potentially muddying the waters, making it even more difficult uh, for people to understand? If the, the 2010 Act is misinterpreted or not interpreted in the right way and so on, is another bill and potentially another bill just not going to make it even more difficult to publicise? Well, are we talking about my... Responsible Dog Ownership Bill. Yeah, well, all the bills coming together. Right. I just wonder First whether we all, should have one piece of legislation to cover uh, all responsible pet ownership. I think that's a question we can put to the Minister. Well, all, all I was, I'm happy to answer it because it, this is something completely different. I don't know an existing piece of legislation that puts duties on somebody acquiring, in law, puts duties on someone acquiring, acquiring a puppy or dog. Don't know one. So it isn't just tackling out, out, you know, out of control or all that. It's tackling... When I looked at puppy factory farms and looked at Gumtree, you can't legislate in Scotland for Ireland or the rest of the world. That's common sense, other jurisdictions. So I was looking at tackling demand rather than supply. And by tackling demand and also tackling irresponsible, and I mean it's the nicest possible way to understand why people buy you know, spontaneously. By tackling that at the very, very beginning, we start to deal, in my view, with the welfare of uh, puppies and dogs. 
So it is very different. I don't know any other piece that's tried to do it that way around. I mean, it's up to Parliament at the end of the day, if it's or committee, the first stage one, it might sink on its knees for all I know. But I'm going to have a good go at it. And I don't think for one minute it does the same thing as the control of dogs. And after all, we have quite a range of legislation on other topics. And please don't compare my legislation with the Offensive Behaviour Bill. Um, I won't comment what I think about that in public. Um, uh, as I chair that... Uh, but I think, uh, if, I think the NGBU will do a really good job on this. I think bits will have to probably come out about the five down to three. But I have checked with the government that this, in fact, will not sabotage this because the thrust of this is that conversation between the licensed breeder, the breeder and the owner, and then they're locked in, as it were, a statutory contract. You've said you've done all those things. So I'm going right back to the beginning. Is in my view, we have to do something about the fad. And there is a fad, to some extent, of people acquiring sometimes designer puppies and everything else, like a handbag, uh, and getting them and not having the suitable uh, facilities for them. The dog gets into trouble, they get into trouble, it's miserable, and then they think they can just move on and give it to somebody else. I want to stop that. Do members have any further questions for Christine Graham? Christine, can I thank you very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I'm going to suspend for a couple of minutes to uh, have a change of, over of witnesses. Thank you.
Item four is post-legislative scrutiny of the Control of Dogs 2010 Act. I'd like to welcome our second panel of witnesses to the committee's meeting this morning. Ash Denham, MSP, Minister for Community Safety, and Philip Lamont, Criminal Justice Division of the Scottish Government. I understand that the Minister is not making an opening statement, so we'll proceed straight to questions. Um, I'm going to open up, Minister. We've heard evidence over the last few weeks and further evidence this morning from Christine Graham, MSP, as she was the MSP that took the legislation we are scrutinising forward about many of the issues um, around the Act. We're really interested uh, to start off with this morning a little bit about um, the ministerial uh, responsibility for this. You're, you've come to give us evidence this morning, but we also understand that Marie Goujon has ministerial responsibility for some of the activity that's going on in the sphere of dogs, because we have a few bills at the moment. We have this uh, post-legislative scrutiny of the 2010 Act. We also have Christine Graham's uh, bill on responsible breeding and ownership of dogs. We have a bill from Emma Harper, MSP, on proposed protection of livestock. We have a bill from Jeremy Balfour, MSP, on pet shop licensing. And we also have Finn's Law, which is a Westminster piece of legislation, but which I understand the Scottish Government have committed will become legislation here. Can you give us a sense of perhaps how the Government intends to um, move forward or maybe pull together all of the legislation in this area, if you have plans to do so, and also how it splits across ministerial portfolios? Uh, well... Uh, I know that Christine Graham's bill that she was talking about this morning, um, the one that she's considering um, bringing forward, uh, does fall under the responsibility of Marie Goujon's portfolio, and that Emma Harper's bill on the uh, worrying of livestock, that falls under Marie Goujon's bill as well, um, uh, portfolio as well. So really this morning I'm here obviously to um, give evidence as a witness in the Control of Dogs Act this morning. So We have seen... Um it's come to the committee's attention because of the increase in the amount of dog attacks. We understand that there were 5,000 uh, presentations to A&E uh, just last year, and that's of humans that have been attacked by dogs. That's not to even account for um, the dogs that are attacked by other dogs in the community and we have heard so much evidence on some of the frightening attacks that people have experienced, owners have experienced there. So, I mean, given the concern about this, given some of the evidence which I'm sure you've read, um, the evidence we've taken on these issues, what is your reaction to the fact that there seems to be an increasing problem with control of dogs in Scotland? Well, I think the first thing we need to say is we don't actually know that for sure. So um, there isn't really a clear picture. Um, you know, you've mentioned some evidence. There obviously the um, committee also took some evidence from um, Dave Joyce of the Communication Workers Union, and that was obviously regarding postal workers. And um, his evidence seemed to suggest that he thought there had been a reduction in that area. So although obviously I, I do note the evidence that was given to you about an increase um, potentially in hospitals dealing with dog bites, we don't um, have a sort of a, a year on year set number of figures. So it's, it's, it's impossible really for us to tell um, if there have been an increase. Unfortunately, the evidence just doesn't show a clear picture. However, Obviously, you know, as a government and indeed as a person, you know, one dog bite is one too many. Absolutely. So um, we should all be encouraging, you know, dog owners to um, manage their dogs, you know, responsibly. We want dogs to be under control at all times. And um, we don't want to see, you know, dogs being out of control in any manner in anybody's community. 5,000 presentations to A&E and that's just human victims and many of them are children must concern you as the minister in charge. Do you think, looking at the 2010 Act, there is any uh, need for strengthening, perhaps, of the Act or for penalties? You will have also seen the uh, evidence we took about the real confusion of responsibility between councils and police about who's responsible for enforcement. What's your reaction to that? Okay. You know, as I said, I think one bite is one bite too many. I mean, my sister was bitten by a dog when I was small. I remember it distinctly. You know, we were indoors and we were in a shop 
um, I think I was about eight years old and she was six and I think you've taken evidence on this already you know the fact that children are so much lower down means they're kind of face to face with dogs and she was bitten on the face so um, clearly um, we want we don't want you know that to be occurring and um, so you know we do want to have a regime in place where um, and I think um, Christine Graham's evidence this morning has drawn this out where we want to encourage people to act um, you know to manage their dogs um, in a, a responsible way and make sure they are under control at all times and I think the you know, the objective of um, Christine Graham's was that sort of preventative element to try and encourage people and so it's to sort of guide them and steer them into um, controlling their dogs in a better way. And I think the dog control notices do, you know, obviously have the potential to do that. We've seen, um, obviously, through the evidence that a number of um, local authorities have approached this in a different way. So clearly some of them are issuing um, a high number of notices, some of them are not using it in the same way, um, some of them have very good collaborative working where they're working very well with Police Scotland between the local authorities and Police Scotland and that seems to be working well and we've seen some really good examples of, of best practice where it has been working well but then perhaps there's other um, areas where it isn't working quite so well. My question, Minister, was do you think the legislation needs to be strengthened? Do you think the government needs to bring in new laws or strengthened laws to deal with this? Well, obviously this um, was not Scottish Government legislation. Obviously this was a member's bill that was um, approved by Parliament at the time. Yes. Um, I am very interested in the, um, the, the scrutiny that's been undertaken by this committee and I'll be very interested to see what the committee's report is on this. No current plans to bring forward Scottish Government legislation on this area of dog control? No. Okay. However, uh, obviously we have been watching the evidence um, carefully and we've noted uh, the, obviously the issue of the databases has, has come up. Uh, my officials have already been looking into this and um, I can advise the committee that we will be doing a consultation on the issue of the database this year. Thank you very much. Colin Beattie. Um, we've talked about dog control notices and uh, how relatively effective or ineffective they are. And there's clearly a very, very different pattern across Scotland. Some areas are using them relatively frequently, others virtually not at all. But where is a dog control notice issued? There is a... Uh, a data protection issue, apparently, where the person gets a dog control notice, but nobody else can find out what the content of that is. Do you think that that's uh, a valid interpretation? Well, uh, the Control of Dogs Scotland Act um, in itself doesn't prohibit uh, details regarding the dog control notice being shared with third parties, but obviously there is an interplay there with other legislation. Um, I'll let um, Philip explain that in a little bit more detail for the committee. Yeah, I mean, as you've heard from various local authorities, there's actually a slightly different approach taken by some local authorities in this area. First and foremost, local authorities have to satisfy themselves as to their own, with their own legal advice about what they can and can't share in terms of information. But there was certainly one local authority that gave evidence, um, I think it was East Ayrshire, but I stand to be corrected, where they did, where someone made a report of a dog being out of control and a dog control notice was issued. What the local authority did was tell the person that action had been taken and that conditions had been imposed on the dog but what they didn't do was any sh share any personal details of the individual, the owner of the dog. Now that um, was not the approach taken by some of the other local authorities so it's clearly there's a dis different approach taken but ultimately it boils down to each local authority must be satisfied that they're in operating in line with data protection legislation. But we can't be satisfied if there's a, a different interpretation of the same legislation across the whole country. Otherwise, there's no uniformity in approach. That's not acceptable, surely. Well, there, there isn't a uniformity of approach. I think we've seen that from, from the statistics. Obviously, the Scottish Government, um, and Philip can give more detail on this, but the Scottish Government does write out to all the local authorities, and that's how we have that data, to ask them how many dog control notices they have applied. So there isn't a uniformity of approach. Um, different local authorities are, are doing things in a different way. Obviously, some of them are prioritising it in a different way. They have different numbers of dog wardens and so on. So, yes, that, that is the case. And obviously, that is up to local authorities. That is um, an operational matter for them. Do you believe that a dog control notice can be effective if, they, if the terms of that dog control notice are kept secret? Well, I mean, there are several issues there. Obviously, the um, dog control notice uh, operates in that local authority and it doesn't apply across Scotland, so that's one issue. Um, I mean, it, it's not secret in the sense that the dog warden will know what the conditions are and they have a duty within the 2010 Act to enforce each dog control notice they issue. 
but um, the point you make more generally about people being aware of the conditions. Um, as I said, one local authority adopts an approach where they do share some of the details. So um, I think, as the Minister said, there is uh, a variety of approaches taken um, in terms of how the legislation is being interpreted and other data, more specific data protection legislation is being interpreted as well. Do you believe that the use of fixed penalty notices to deal with minor breaches of dog control notices would be effective? Would it uh, perhaps rate, lift some of the administrative burden in court? Colin, can I, can I pause you there? I think I'd like to take a couple of supplementaries on data protection. I'll bring okay. you back in on that point. On, I've got a couple of members interested in the data protection point that we want to pursue. <coughs> Let me, let me read this to you, because we took in, um, evidence from Alison Robertson, who's from the National Dog Warden Association. And she told the committee that the confidentiality is in place because the Scottish Government advised us that as the 2010 Act is civil law and a dog control notice is a civil measure, data protection prevents us from saying that a notice is in place. Now, that was advice from the Scottish Government. Can you respond to that, please, Minister? And then I'll bring in Christine Graham and Alex Neil on this point. I'll let Philip answer and give the committee detail on that one. Right, OK. I mean, okay. The, the only formal Scottish Government view on the operation of the 2010 Act is contained in the guidance for the 2010 Act that was issued alongside implementation. So um, I'm sure m members have seen this. It does talk about data protection um, in it. That question... Um, Questions that there's certainly a data protection question. That, uh, clear the National Dog Warden Association said that the Scottish Government advised the dog wardens that data protection prevents them from saying a notice is in the, place. Is that correct? Well, that the Scottish I, Government gave that advice to local authorities? I'm not aware of the Scottish Government offering a formal legal view in that way because that's not something the Scottish Government would do. I'm sure data protection was discussed as part of the implementation of the legislation. Um, if Alison Robertson was able to point to the formal um, letter or guidance that says that, I'd be happy to consider that further. Um, clearly, however, data protection is an issue, um, not least because you can see the different approaches adopted by local authorities. In terms of why data protection is an issue... From your answer to Colin Beattie, that the Scottish Government's position on this is that it is up to local authorities to interp interpret data protection legislation on this, and you're comfortable with the fact that it is interpreted differently in different local authorities? Well, each local authority will clearly have its own legal advice advisors, which it will consult, so yes. Okay. Christine Graham, on this point, please. I just, I, well, I just think we're kind of going round in circles here with this, because it seems to me that this Act is a self-policing Act, that someday it's the public who report they think a dog is out of control, a dog control notice is issued, there's only one dog warrant, two dog warrants that are safe for the whole of the borders, they can't be there to see if the, dog's breach, the, the owner's breached the dog control notice, again it's policed by the public. For me, and you probably can't answer it because you haven't, and I understand why, I don't understand what data is being protected here. You're not the... All you're saying is a dog control notice has been issued. Here are the conditions. What data, what personal data is being protected there? This is not about... There's no personal data in that. Minister. This is the details of a notice. Minister. Well, that's correct. And obviously, from the evidence um, that the committee's heard, some local authorities are, are doing that. So if someone makes a complaint about a dog, they will then go back to that person to say that a dog control notice has been issued because the data is about the dog. And, do, you know, they're not sharing any details about um, the owner, for instance. But, uh, Philip, do you have any more information on that? And are you unhappy about this then? Because, I mean, if it were your legislation, not mine, and that was being said, would you be saying, well, writing to, you know, the data, <laughs> data protection officer and saying, you know, this is wrong. I mean, this is not a role for government here, rather than just standing back. I mean, you, you, you're you able to say, well, this can't, this, this is a nonsense. This can't be proper, that people don't know what the conditions are, therefore can't tell that it's enforced. If it were your legislation, would you not be saying something about this? I mean... It's, it's not Scottish government legislation, so so therefore, so on that on that basis, in, the operational, the operation of the legislation is for local authorities, so it's a matter for them. Clarify, we, we've heard in your evidence this morning a few times this is not Scottish government legislation. This is the law of Scotland, and this is under your portfolio. So, however, this law came through Parliament for me is beside the point. This is your responsibility. I refer Christine. On the, can you answer the the point, please? Yeah. 
that let's was forget that it's a member's bill. Let's forget all this. If it's, it's legislation, mm -hmm. you must. You're not happy, surely, that it's differently enforced throughout Scotland. So, is there not a role for the government now in issuing, in your guidance, that in your view, that this is not personal information. This is information, as the minister quite rightly says, about the dog. Well, we could certainly consider looking at the statutory guidance that was issued in respect of the 2010 yeah. Act to see whether data protection could be covered in more detail to reflect the different approaches that have emerged. And that's something that the government could certainly consider. Yeah, I'd be happy to look at look at that further. If you, if you could, Minister, I think the committee would be very grateful. We heard some really worrying evidence from different councils. East Ayrshire is quite proactive <coughs> so that there can be general enforcement. They tell the conditions. Obviously, they have view to data protection. But in other councils, it's just used as a blank. You know, we heard in from, uh, evidence in Dundee that people, the dog wardens are saying data protection, we can't tell you any of the conditions around the dog control notice. And then the people see the dog in the street the next day and they have no idea if it's asked to be muzzled, kept in the house, any of these conditions. It seems really unsatisfactory. I, I understand the point the committee is making. It's clearly because different councils are taking advice, on, you know, different advice, and and that's the way they've chosen to um, enforce it. But it's, uh, certainly, as um, I'll get my officials to look into that point and get back to the committee on it. Helpful, Colin Beattie. I interrupted your questioning. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to come back to the question of possibilities of fixed penalties in order to deal with minor breaches of dog control notices, it's been raised in evidence to, to the committee by, by a number of different people. It's been suggested it will reduce the administrative burden on courts. What, what's your view on that? Well, I think, obviously, we use fixed penalty notices in other, in, in other areas, and obviously um, they are quite successful in getting people to change their behaviour, if you think about you know, parking tickets and so on. Um, so in this area, I think it could be worthy of exploration. I'm, I'm certainly open to, to looking at that. Obviously, the Crown Office uh, already possess powers to um, offer something, it's called direct measures, to dog owners who breach uh, the terms of their dog control notices. So I think giving the police or indeed giving local authorities um, powers potentially that are similar to that, it could be a good way of um, dealing proportionally with breaches. I think I wouldn't, my view on that was, I, I don't think we should replace it with fixed penalty notices, but I think maybe as an addition that it might be something that's worth exploring. Government support the Act being amended to include fixed penalty notices. I think it's something that's definitely worth exploring. We we'll talk about minor breaches. What uh, what would you what would you view be on what was considered a minor breach and what would still have to be reported to the procurator fiscal? I think this is something that would require consultation. I think there's um, obviously dog control notices can contain a whole variety of different measures from how high your fence is, keep your dog in, to muzzling, being on a lead and so on. So I think th uh, clearly there would be a difference there between someone that generally complies and maybe once forgets to put their dog on a lead with somebody who's been asked to muzzle their dog who goes out in public every time and doesn't muzzle their dog. So I think there would need to be consultation on that in order to determine that. Hmm. Alex Neil. Can I first of all ask why, a, since this legislation has been law for nine years, and the Scottish Government still has not implemented the national, set up the national database? I mean, I hear what you're saying about um, going out to consultation this year. Why on earth has it taken nine years to get to a consultation on it? Well, the 2010 Act obviously did uh, provide a discretionary power for the database to be established, but actually um, the database wasn't envisaged as being in place right from the outset of the dog control uh, notice regime. And if I just read from the financial memorandum of the bill, it said, while the bill provides the Scottish Government with the power to establish a national database, it's not envisaged that in the first instance such a database would be established. But I do accept the point that obviously um, quite a few years have passed now and um, the database has not been set up. Um, it's certainly something um, that we are looking at. I think um, some local authorities have suggested um, that it, it, it would be advantageous because obviously if somebody moves from one area to another, it would allow them to share that information. We Obviously, we don't have the figures on that. We, we imagine it would only um, really relate to a very small number of people. Um, and we're certainly, um, you know, looking to, we would consult on that this year. 
but we'd be very interested also to hear what the committee's views on that would be as to what the benefits of it would be. Can I just clarify, a Minister, you're saying it would only apply to a small number of people. That, that's in relation to people moving between local authorities, but the national ba database is actually to set up much more. I mean, you probably, I take it you heard Christine Graham's evidence uh, earlier, and one of the points she was making is this is not just about recording the microchip number, it should be also about recording the number of DCNs, the number of written and oral warnings, etc., etc., etc. And it does seem, and you're a new minister, so I'm not in any way blaming you, but it does seem the total lack of leadership and indeed complacency in the part of the Justice Department over this problem. You know, we have clear evidence, particularly of children, 5,000 people presenting to A&E every year, a very high proportion of them, according to the doctors who are children. Uh, some of them, I mean, we've... As you probably heard or know of the evidence that was given from a couple from Dundee where their child was killed, mauled to death. Surely this is something that should be getting a higher priority inside the Justice Department than has been clearly the case for the last nine years. I mean, I, I'm obviously, you know, children being attacked by dogs, it is, you know, obviously it's very distressing. Um, I wouldn't want to um, see anybody being attacked like that by a dog, but clearly the legislation for the criminal liability on that would um, be under the Dangerous Dogs Act of 91 um, and the Control of Dogs Act that we're discussing today. But clearly I accept there is overlap between those two things and I do accept that. Um, I think there is, potentially there is some merit in a database. Um, I'm very interested to hear what the committee's views would be on, on what you know the database potentially should cover. Um, how beneficial the committee thinks that it would be. I think we would need to consult in order to see what it should cover and um, to see what stakeholders have to say about it. Also to decide, you know, um, who would run it. You know, should this be run by a lead local authority, for instance, and, um, you know, to answer those type of questions. But this is obviously just March. So you said this year, the consultation. By this year, do you mean fairly soon or by December? I can't give you a time frame at the moment, I'm sorry, but it would definitely be this year. So has this just been a, a knee-jerk reaction to the uh, work of the committee? You just decided to come to the committee with a consultation on one bit of the legislation? Well, clearly, um, my officials have been... We've been watching the, the evidence. We're very interested in, in what the, the, the work that the committee is doing on this. And I think there is merit in uh, potentially having a database, and that's why we're saying we will look into it. Can I ask why are you only consulting on the national database? I mean, there's quite a number of other issues come out of this, clearly in the evidence. I mean, one area of particular concern to us has been something that wasn't in the bill, but has emerged from the prosecutors and the judiciary, mm. whereby, you know, one bite, no matter how severe the bite, is allowed before there's any prosecution. Mm -hmm. Why are you not consulting on that? Well, that's actually, I think, what you're, you're, are you referring to the one bite rule yes. that some people um, talk about, um, which actually relates to the Dangerous Dogs Act of, of 91. So um, the idea behind that is that um, a person needs to have reasonable apprehension yeah. that their dog is going to behave in the manner, obviously, to injure somebody in the way that we've been speaking about. And so I suppose the question is there. Um, sh um, I suppose the question is, should uh, an owner be responsible for a dog that acts in, I suppose, in the way that they would say, in a way that's completely out of character, where they felt there was no warning to it whatsoever? Should they be held criminally liable for that? Or the way the legislation is set up at the moment is that they, they would have this reasonable apprehension. But um, I'll ask if Philip can explain a little bit more about the Dangerous Dogs Act of 91 and why that um, provision is in there. Well, we I mean, I think we know what, why yes, that uh, provision is in there. Mr. My, Neil. My, my question really is, you know, given the number of maulings that have been, even where death hasn't been involved, um, and given that some of those dogs involved in these maulings, uh, this is the first and only bite they've actually committed. It seems to me so that's something that government should be concerned about and acting upon. Now, I, again, I emphasise, Ash, you, you're a new minister, I'm not blaming you in any way, but it seems to me the Justice Department has shown total complacency in this whole issue. Mr Lamont. I... I hear what the committee is saying on that. I think you're, that you're making an extremely good point on that. As I've said, we are very interested in what the committee is doing. We're very interested in the work the committee and our, you know, 
I'd be very interested to look at what the committee's views are and what you you recommend around um, changing. If you recommend around changing the law in this area, we will certainly look at that as a government. It so, might, can I just also it might be helpful to say that when um, Christine Graham brought forward the control of dogs bill back in two thousand and nine. Um, I seem to recall you've been very clear that this that legislation was not about changing the fundamental of the fundamentals of the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991. So, as the member in charge in Parliament decided to focus on a civil preventative regime rather than changing the criminal law, but there would have been an opportunity at that point to look at the law if that had been wanted and that wasn't taken. Clearly, the way the criminal law works in this area was set by the UK government back in 1991 in UK-wide legislation, it would be open for government and this parliament to change that law so that, for example, the reasonable apprehension test no longer applied, so that someone would be criminally liable if their dog, um, e even completely out of character, did bite someone, but that's a criminal law policy matter to be considered. Well, my point is, it hasn't been considered, and given we have enough evidence to know there is a big issue out there, although, as the Minister said, it's not been properly quantified. The fact it's not been properly quantified is another area where there's been absolutely no activity from the Justice Department again. And it seems to me this, I mean, it just reeks of a lack of leadership and total complacency. And I think you need to get out of your complacency on this, because with the evidence we have heard, there is no room for complacency, not just in relation to the working of this particular act in 2010, but in terms of this problem of dog attacks. It's a very serious issue, particularly for children. And it seems to me it's something government needs to get a grip of um, as a priority. Uh, and it's preventive. I mean, it's costing the health service a lot of money. More importantly, it's costing a lot of human suffering. And it seems to me the Justice Department down the years, uh, and hopefully the new minister will change that culture. It's time the Justice Department got a grip. Can I just finally ask, back to the Minister, uh, you outlined the division of responsibility between Ministers in terms of proposed legislation, but what's the rationale, you know, uh, there must be behind that some kind of guidance on who, what determines who's responsible for what. Um, I mean, the consequence of the rationale is that Marie Goujon is responsible for the other two bills and you're responsible for this bill, but what is... Is, is, there a, is there a protocol within government that says, in terms of this area of activity, the Justice Res Department is responsible for this, and the Agriculture Department is responsible, or Rural Affairs is responsible for that? What's the rationale for the division? Yeah, I just, just to address your, your previous point, you know, about complacency, the government is absolutely not complacent about this issue. This is a very serious issue and we are not complacent about this. Um, and moving on to your second part of your question about, um, you know, who decides on what. Has it not so, done anything then? Just nine years. Nine years. Nine years. And we haven't even got a consultation. We haven't even got a date for a consultation on the national database. Well, I would say to you, the national database is clearly not the whole picture. It's what it's one part of it. But, it, and, you know, and a database in point. itself will not obviously, um, you know, be the panacea to, to everything in this area. But I do, you know, I do have taken on board that point about the database, and we will we will look at that. But in terms of um, how things are decided in government, clearly, you know, all the portfolios have a portfolio split. Sometimes there are areas where it's not always immediately clear um, where a certain piece of legislation would, would fall, which minister it would fall to, and so decisions are are taken. I mean, the general rule is that where the control of dogs relates to people and injuries to people, it falls within justice. Where dog regulation relates to the welfare of the dogs themselves or the welfare of other animals, it tends to fall in other portfolios. That's the general split. So that's why, for example, livestock worrying and the measures mentioned by Christine Graham would fall to environment rather than justice. Urging theme. If you look at Christine's bill, Christine can correct me in this, but it seems to be that she would her bill would fall under under both of those categories because it deals with people and it deals with and, and this legislation falls under both because it's about dog dog on dog attacks as well as dog on human attacks. So uh, it seems to me that we need a more joined up approach, uh, and maybe that's something the government should look at in terms of uh, who does what because it doesn't look to me as though the government's joined up on this. Supplementary on this point specifically, Christine Graham. It's on the role of the, the Justice Department here. I just get a feeling that because this is, this is my theme of mine, that because it's a Members Act of Parliament, it's not given the same authority or treatment as government 
legislation, even though the Parliament has uh, voted it through, may sometimes not vote through government legislation. Am I wrong in that? Because, uh, you know, the database, all that delay, if that had been government legislation, would we have had it by now? Probably. You know, the enforcement of it? Probably. My concern is that it's just, well, it's a member's bill, it's a member's act of Parliament. Pat on the head, you've had your moment, off we go. I think it would be very difficult for me to comment on the treatment um, of members' bills versus government bills. I, I don't. I wouldn't be able. I haven't got the evidence in front of me to be able to say whether that would be the case or not. That's certainly, the tenor of the answer to the first few questions this morning. You said, "Well, this was a members' bill. This was." You kept saying this was a members' bill. Does it not have the same weight in government in terms of enforcing and enacting? Well, obviously there is. Um, there is a financial consideration here that members' bills. Obviously, um, when Christine Graham brought forward her bill, it was to have minimal cost, um, and perhaps that is that is the reason. Yeah. I think this committee's views that the database, you know, the, the five thousand presentations to A and E, the cost of that may possibly, you know, offset the cost of a database. Certainly, we don't have those kind of figures in front of us because the Scottish government hasn't presented any costs yet on a database. Mm -hmm. But it's costing the NHS if we're going to talk about the cost of this. Mm -hmm. A considerable amount of money. No, I, I have do not have to convince me about the benefit of preventive spending. So I, I agree with that completely. Okay, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. I'd, I'd like to initially go back to something uh, that you said to Colin Beatty about dog control notices. Uh, so you mentioned quite rightly that they don't apply across Scotland. So would you be supportive of the Act being amended to allow dog control notices to apply across Scotland and not just within the local authority area uh, where they've been issued? I think there is some merit in that, yes, I do. Because, you know, if you think if a dog is out of control in Glasgow, but then it, it goes to Edinburgh, it's still out of control. So, yes, I, I think there is some merit in, pursuing, in looking into that, certainly. And on licensing, I also asked Christine Graham, uh, earlier on about uh, a licensing scheme. Can you tell us, is that something that's being explored uh, by the Scottish Government? And if so, uh, to what level? Have any costings been done, for example? Well, the Scottish Government did actually consult on this in 2013. The committee may be aware about that, about whether licensing should, in fact, be reintroduced. So the responses to the consultation showed that there was quite a mixed picture um, among the people that responded. And of those that offered a view, 46% of them were opposed to the reintroduction of licensing and 32 were supportive. So obviously that shows that more were opposed to it, uh, the reintroduction of, of licensing. Um, there, we don't even have a clear picture, in fact, of how many dogs um, there are in Scotland. So one estimate that we have um, from the pet food manufacturers is that there's around about 640, maybe 650,000 dogs in Scotland. And clearly introducing a licensing scheme um, of that size uh, would probably be quite a complex process. Um, so I think in that case there are a number of issues that would obviously need to be looked at in that area. There's quite a few things to consider. Um, the other thing I think... Just, on that, just if I might take that point, uh, because just following on from the line that Alex Neil was taking there, the, the way you answered that rather suggested to me that the Scottish Government looked at it and said, we've no idea how many dogs are out there, therefore we've no idea how much it would cost, therefore the easiest thing to do would just be to kind of bury it and not, not do anything about it. I, is that, am I reflecting back what I've just heard? No. The, what I've just said to you is that when the Government consulted on this quite recently, um, there was a mixed picture um, in result of it and that 46% of the people that responded to the consultation were opposed to the reintroduction of licensing. So as a government, when we consult, we do try to listen as much as possible to what um, the consultation responses say and, to, and to obviously to take account of that. I'm not saying um, you know, that the government is um, completely against the idea of licensing. It's something that we certainly would look at and obviously I'll be interested to hear um, what the committee's views are on that. I think the other point to make here is that um, with any licensing scheme, I suppose there is a possibility that responsible dog owners would sign up where the irresponsible dog owners, um, I guess the ones that we are looking to clamp down upon, may not sign up. Um, and th this would be a considerable undertaking for local authorities. So I think there are you know, a number of issues that we would need to look at before we could, um, you know, be, before the government would say that they were looking to reintroduce that scheme. It would be a considerable undertaking, but I, I mean, this committee has evidence that at least on one scenario, it could become cost neutral, if not 
profitable for local authorities. And it just rather strikes me again to take Alex Neil's point that that's something that I would have thought the Scottish Government would be looking at. And that brings me back to this consultation. I understand the point about a consultation was done, but that was six years ago. Uh, we've heard from Alec Neil's line of questioning that uh, there is a consultation at some point going to be launched uh, about a database, in, presumably in response to the work this committee's been doing. Isn't there a point at which you say, well, look, why don't we look at a licensing scheme as part of that consultation as well? Would that be a fair assumption? Uh, we certainly could do that, but I am not. I have to say at this point, I'm not completely convinced about the idea of licensing. But I would look. I'd be happy to look at the evidence that the committee puts forward on that. Thank you. Thank you, and ask Sarvar. Direct questions to, to the minister. Do you think there's enough public awareness of their rights under the Control of Dogs Act? I think. Um, Certainly, from the evidence that the committee's taken, I think that, you know the levels of awareness in general. I think there is a good level of awareness, but I think there are areas where pe perhaps people are not quite clear about the difference between the two, and you know that sort of thing. So I think that um, uh, some of the evidence has shown that there can be a little bit of confusion between the two, and I think possibly that is natural because there is that overlap between the two acts. So just a, is that a yes or a no? Sorry. And do you think there's adequate public knowledge about their rights under the Control of Dogs Act? I think it's the same with any law, you know, that there will always be people who don't know what the law is. I don't think that you can expect everyone to know. Everyone knows about the smoking ban, for example. Well, I don't know that you could say that definitively. OK. Do you think there is adequate training for all dog wardens across Scotland? Well, obviously, that would be a matter for the local authorities to What's determine your view? that. Well, the, in, the, in the Act, it says that there must be, in every area, uh, one warden that has you know, sufficient knowledge and expertise about the control of dogs and that they are responsible for um, you know, instruction of the other wardens. So that's what's in the Act. So beyond that, obviously, it is up to the local authority in, in how they operate that. But in your view as the Minister for Community Safety, do you think all dog wardens are adequately trained in Scotland? Um, I don't think we have the data on what training the wardens have undertaken as a government, do we? I don't think okay. we do. And as, as the Minister for Community Safety, do you think there are enough dog wardens across Scotland? Again, uh, that's obviously a matter for local authorities. And I think uh, Anna Sarawar would probably be the first person to complain if the Scottish Government was insisting that local authorities were doing things incorrectly and trying to get them to do things in a different way. So that obviously is for local authorities to determine. It's an operational matter for them. Okay. And as Minister for Community Safety, do you think there's adequate resourcing for the control of dogs across Scotland? Well, clearly, that's also a matter for local authorities, up to them how they prioritise these things, and a decision must be taken by them about how many dog wardens, wardens they employ. And as the Minister for Community Safety, do you think there is adequate protocols and arrangements between Police Scotland and local authorities across Scotland? Well, obviously, um, that is something the government did do. So we, um, coming back to your previous question, um, and in 2016, we did um, facilitate the development of the protocol um, to lay out uh, the responsibilities clearly. And I think that's come through in the evidence that the committee has received, that, that the protocol has been well received and it is well regarded. So uh, that is something that the government have done. You said earlier that you accepted a serious issue. Do you, having seen the evidence the committee has taken before, do you accept as a serious issue around uh, the control of dogs and the arrangements to make that happen? I think this is a very serious issue and okay. as a minister I will be looking very carefully at the recommendations that the committee makes. Okay, so if the committee comes back with, with, with recommendations or indeed evidence in its report, having heard what you've heard already, having recognised how serious it is, What's going to change in that dynamic in terms of thinking that it's up to the local authority to make sure people are adequately aware of the um, legislation, to make sure it's up to the local authority to make sure all dog wardens are adequately trained? It's up to the local authority to decide whether there's enough dog wardens. It's up to the local authority to judge whether there's adequate funding and resourcing. It's up to the local authority to decide if they've got adequate protocols with Police Scotland. Is it not just a clean hands for the Scottish Government, nothing to do with us? look somewhere else? Well, clearly, uh, you know, there's... That's what it sounds like. There's scope here, obviously, for the government and the parliament could decide to change any or, or all of that. You know, if we wanted to change the law, if we wanted to change um, the law as it relates to the Dangerous Dogs Act, um, and indeed as it relates to the Control of Dogs Act, there is scope, obviously, for, for that to be changed. 
Uh, what I'm saying to you is I'm not going to sit here today and um, make up government policy. So I would want that to be based at all times on evidence, um, on consideration, on consultation, which is what I've, I've said this morning. So I will certainly, I'm, you know, I do think this is a serious issue. And I am certainly going to look at what the committee's report puts forward and the recommendations. And I am open to pursuing, you know, if the committee makes some strong recommendations as a government, we will certainly look at that and pursue them. And final question, Minister. Do you recognise that for the families who have shared their own experiences with this committee, either, either through the public meetings we've had in different areas across the country or indeed meetings in this uh, parliament, if they were sitting in the gallery today or they were to watch the evidence today, how frustrated and frankly angry and disappointed they would be at what sounds like a very complacent, hands-off, somebody else's problem response from the Minister for Community Safety and the Scottish Government? I, I do understand what you're saying on that point. I do. That worries me even more. Thank you. Willie Cox, is it a supplementary on this point? Because the okay, I'm going to take Willie Coffey right. first and then come to you, Christine. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I wanted to come back to that issue about reasonable apprehension that Alec Neil introduced, Minister. That's been part of the Dangerous Dogs Act for 28 years. I'm surprised, frankly, coming to this committee, that it's taken 28 years for that to become an issue in Scotland or elsewhere. So it's been there a long, long time. But what I think the witnesses told us, their, their concerns, Minister, were that in some of the serious dog attacks, serious bite, serious attacks, that the test of this reasonable apprehension seemed to apply firstly. The two representatives from the Fiscal Service seemed to confirm that, and that's what's sort of given rise to this sense that there's a one free bite in operation, which they, they, they said was not the case, but when they described the law, they explained the law to us that the test for reasonable apprehension must apply firstly. So I was wondering if I'd be obliged if the Scottish Government would, would give some consideration to that, to see whether we could look at that issue and focus, in, I think in the committee's views and the public view, on the attack that took place and the severity of that. Mm -hmm to see whether the law could be adapted, modified, to give priority to the attack and the injury, mm. rather than the sense that we had to demonstrate reasonable apprehension in the first instance. Yes, uh, I, I, do, I do take that on board, that people, there is this perception that there is the one free bite rule, and, but obviously that um, is, is not the case, but then there is the reasonable apprehension um, test. I certainly would be happy to hear what the committee um, have to say about that and whether they think that you know that the law should be changed in that area. Christine Graham. Um, I'm a bit concerned that we're conflating the Control of Dogs Act with the Dangerous Dogs Act because one free bite does not appear in the Control of Dogs Act. However, however, that said, um, Minister, you said that, yes, there is a bit of a problem, about, but you think people, you know, it, they, they know about, uh, they, most many people know about the Control of Dogs Act. I seriously don't think that's the case. I think if you walked out of here and went to Tesco's with your shopping trolley and you just stopped people randomly and said, have you heard of the Dangerous Dogs Act? Yes. Have you heard of the Control of Dogs Scotland Act? No. I don't think people know about it. And I'm back to what I said, I'm sure you heard my evidence, is that when it's a member's bill, once that bill is through, there is no publicity to it unless the member takes it out of their allowances from their office. And that's the problem for these bills of the legislation. And this is a prime example of what I think is a decent piece of legislation. I say that not just because it's mine. I think it's preventative. You said you're on the side of preventative. Who isn't? But unless it's publicised, you've even got policemen that don't know about the Control of Dogs Act. So you can write all the protocols in the world, and they even differ. It's not going to matter if nobody knows about it. So what I'm asking of the government is, because in a parliamentary answer to me, I've told it's up to the government to pick up publicity for members, Will, are you going to do it? Yes, yeah, so you're, you're speaking about awareness raising, about whether the government would be prepared to undertake an awareness raising programme around this um, piece of legislation. I think that is certainly something that the government would look at, yes. Alex Neil. Just a quickly supplementary, Minister. You read out from the bill, it's, from the Act itself, the statutory requirement for local authorities to have wardens. How many local authorities in Scotland are in breach of that statutory requirement? I don't have that information to hand. I don't know if Philip has. Um, 
that's not information that's routinely collected by the Scottish Government. You don't routine, routinely collect it? You don't monitor it? There's, there's no monitoring requirement. If this had been a government bill, would it have been monitored? It depends what's in the legislation. There's no requirement to... Um, there's no enforcement of it in the sense that there's no... Nothing happens to the local authority if they don't have... If they don't meet the requirements. Well, that's I how, have to say, as the, the person who originally passed. sponsored the bill, I find that response from the Justice Department totally unacceptable. I think the very least you should be doing is monitoring statutory requirements. Carson. Um, whilst the, the 2010 Act wasn't specifically intended to, to deal with livestock worrying, is there scope within the bill at the moment uh, to, to deal with dogs in the countryside? Is that something that you believe the, the bill can already deal with? Because if a dog is at, you know, there's, I guess there's not much difference between a dog being out of control on a, an urban street and a dog being out of control in a field where there are sheep. So, um, yes, the, 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 it would still apply. So, so that would indicate that, that, again, there is maybe a, a lack of understanding or a lack of publicity over the 2010 because we've got a, a member's bill which is coming forward mm -hmm. to address the lack of enforcement when it comes to, to livestock worrying. Um, and we've got, as we've already heard, Jen Jeremy Balfour's bringing forward a bill, we've got Finn's Law, we've got uh, various other bills coming forward. Um, the committee has received evidence uh, suggesting that consolidating all these bills into one uh, piece of dog control legislation would improve clarity and publicise it. Is that something you'd be supportive of? Um, I think it's something that we could look at. Um, the government doesn't have any plans at the moment to, to do a consolidation of the type that you've described, but it is certainly something that we could look at if we felt that it would Im improve clarity in the way that you're suggesting. But do you, uh, you're consulting at the moment on responsible pet ownership, is that right? Um, I, th I think there is a consultation being led by all the ministers in that area, yes. Well, I would like to think that responsible pet ownership wouldn't be another piece of standalone legislation, but could potentially encompass all these concerns and bring it forward, that would be something that, that should be considered. I, d well, I mean, it wouldn't fit specifically into the justice portfolio from, what, from the way you're describing it. Okay. Do members have any further questions for the Minister? Minister, I, I have to say this, this, uh, this is a huge issue in my community in terms of safety and safety for children. It's something that worries me deeply. And I know other members feel the same. I had really hoped that the session this morning might see the Scottish Government come forward to say they had looked at what we'd been hearing, they'd done a bit of thinking, they perhaps had some proposals around this. We have a post-legislative function on this committee, but it is a small part of the work that we do. Um, and I have to say that the government has much more vast resources on this and certainly all of your time uh, than we do. We will put forward some proposals, but we would really hope that the government can do some wider thinking and consideration of some of the issues that have been raised today. Um, I now close the public session of this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>